Okay, everyone, let's continue. Our next speaker is Nick from uh, IBM, principal engineer, and he's going to talk about uh, putting Spark machine learning pipelines to production. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for having me here. It's my first time at FOSTEM, so it's great to see all the uh, energy and enthusiasm uh, around open source software at this event, so it's great to be here. So today we're going to talk about uh, productionizing Spark ML pipelines, well actually any machine learning, but with a focus on Spark, with a portable format for analytics, so using open standards for uh, machine learning models. A little bit about me, uh, I'm ML Nick on Twitter and GitHub. I work at IBM in the Spark Technology Center and the Cognitive Open Technology team, uh, predominantly working on machine learning, AI, deep learning, uh, and a lot of my time is spent in the Apache Spark project, I'm a committer and PMC member there, and I've written a fairly out of date book now, but uh, it's called Machine Learning with Spark. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about the machine learning workflow, uh, and then some of the challenges inherent in that workflow, in particular the kind of end piece, which is deploying those, those machine learning pipelines to production, and then how open standards can help solve that problem and some of the work that me and my team have been doing around this, this challenge. Uh, and then finally, kind of a, a summary a, a overview and the future directions of this work. So the machine learning workflow is really simple as we know. You take data, you apply machine learning, and you profit, make money, right? But in reality, you know, it's a very complex beast. So it spans multiple teams. Uh, you know, you've got your data that can be uh, in various forms. Some of it is historical. Some of it is arriving in real time. Uh, it's across data stores, across systems. Uh, you've got lineage. You've got um, metadata. You, you know, you, you need to kind of record all of that. And that's the domain of your data engineering teams, typically in, in a you know in a large a medium to large organization. Then the traditional data science or machine learning workflow that most people think about is, is in the middle here. You, know, you take your data, which uh, you assume is all nice and clean and available to you. You ingest it, you apply some uh, data exploration, feature transformation and, and engineering, and you get that data into a format uh, that you can feed into your machine learning model. And then the, the piece that you know, most people tend to think uh, takes up most of the time, but actually takes up some of the least time is this model training. So actually selecting the model and, and doing your hardcore pure machine learning uh, is only a really small piece, but it is a critical piece here. And that'll, that's uh, the domain of your data scientists and your researchers. And then once they're done with it, they tend to throw it over the wall and say, okay, machine learning and production engineers, here's my model uh, written in R or Python or whatever, and you need to deploy it. So. Um, that, you know, that spans a, a pretty big boundary there, and you need to take the system and this, this workflow into production with all the, um, with all the requirements for scalability, uh, uptime, speed, performance, monitoring that entails that. So it's not just the models that, need you, that you deploy. So you know, you, you've trained this fancy model, but you actually need to deploy this entire workflow of pre-processing steps and feature engineering uh, and cleaning of the data and all of that that comes before it. Uh, and then you've got to worry about versioning. Which version of this model are you deploying? Uh, have the features changed since the last version? So you know, your, your training pipeline needs to talk to your production system about these kind of is issues. And then finally, once it's in production, as I mentioned, the real world system needs to predict on new data, but it also needs to monitor, do live evaluation. It needs to know uh, if things are going wrong. Uh, do I need to retrain the model? Is performance dipping? And it needs to take the feedback from that system uh, and put it into this feedback loop, which then comes back to your historical and streaming data at the beginning, uh, as well as you know, th that data goes back into your, your data science pipeline. So this workflow is really a loop that spans teams as well as tools. Uh, so there's a lot of disparate uh, formats for data. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, and, and those schemas vary with time. So as a, you know, the features, uh, input formats, uh, all the data that, that you have available may, may change. Uh, the definition of that data, the definition of uh, the features may change over time. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of different tools for doing your, your pre-processing. Uh, it's pretty common now to have pipelines uh, that, that do that or some sort of uh, framework or toolkit uh, that allows you to build pipelines such as scikit-learn, Spark, uh, MLlib, TensorFlow and the, the TensorFlow transform the pre-processing steps. 
Um, and then you perform cross-validation, again, uh, sort of spanning R, Python, uh, Spark, whether that's Scala, Java, Python, R, uh, TensorFlow, etc. And then you've got the final model. Uh, so one important uh, sort of thing to note here that I've um, mentioned a little bit before is that the pipeline and the data schema itself has to be completely consistent between your training, uh, your training and data processing step uh, and production. So it doesn't help if you, uh, if you push a model to production and then the, the data coming in to, that, the, the, to the ingest part of that pipeline is not different. If the schema changes, um, if a feature uh, changes or, or disappears in that model, uh, you get complete garbage, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and it's not going to work. So you effectively need to freeze that pipeline and you need to deploy you know, the, the frozen version of that pipeline to production. So I've mentioned some of the challenges. You need to bridge uh, and manage all of these, these different gaps between languages, frameworks, uh, the dependencies of those frameworks, the versions of them. Uh, you know, if a version changes, the behavior might change. Uh, you, you have a, a tight coupling between the training, uh, the version in training and the version in production. So deployment here is, is not really the, uh, in the sense of the DevOps uh, sense of the word of, you know, of deploying an artifact, but it's, it's really the fact that you're deploying this pipeline. So some of the DevOps solutions do help here. I mean, for example, containers are becoming quite popular uh, for all kinds of deployment, but certainly in, in data science and machine learning. Um, and it's obvious to see, to, to see why. You know, it's really compelling to think about uh, you know, we can wrap up the final version of that model in a, in a container and we can deploy that. That does help with uh, things like dependencies and versions, certainly. But it still means that you have to have a, a workflow that, uh, that allows that, you know, and, and every time a, a version updates, uh, that, that, that workflow, that component of your workflow might change. So one other thing to think about is the performance characteristics can be really uh, variable across these, these boundaries. So, uh, model uh, inferencing and scoring in TensorFlow may be quite performant, whereas uh, something in R or, uh, or even Python scikit-learn in some cases, and certainly in, in some cases in Spark, uh, can have serious performance uh, issues, particularly for real-time inference. So ideally, you want to try and homogenize this as much as possible. You want to know that uh, whatever you use for training um, and pre-processing uh, when you put it into production, you want that performance to be uh, predictable. So then a lack of standardization in this space leads to custom solutions. So everybody rolls their own framework uh, for scoring models and their own uh, model serialization formats, their own interchange mechanisms, and it's all, you know, it's all custom. Where standards do exist, and a few, uh, a few do, they, they, are, they have serious limitations, and that ends up uh, leading to more custom stuff. So you, can, you end up writing custom extensions, which, which you know, essentially means you get no benefit from the standard because the, the standard itself is broken and, uh, you, and the portability component of standardization is lost. So that applies to, you know, to any kind of machine learning framework, but certainly uh, for Spark itself, uh, we have a lot of additional challenges. So those of you who know a little bit about the Spark ML may know that uh, you have Spark ML pipelines, which is a, a component that allows you to uh, quite easily and elegantly create uh, machine learning pipelines uh, using the data frame abstraction. So you take data frames and you and you transform uh, the columns of those data frame of that data frame as you go through the components of your pipeline. So pre-processing, feature extraction, um, and then you know uh, machine learning model training, uh, and then you end up with um, with something called a, a pipeline model which is uh, this, exactly this frozen version of your machine learning pipeline or workflow, and you can just feed a data frame in and you get your result out. Sounds very neat. However, when you try to use that to actually deploy to a production scenario, you have a tight coupling to the Spark runtime. So for training, that's great because you want to do training at scale, and uh, Spark allows you to, to scale up both the, the kind of traditional ETL uh, data processing steps, sometimes using Spark SQL uh, components and leveraging the power of the optimizer there. Um, but when it comes to, uh, to inference and, and scoring in real time, you have this uh, overhead of the data frame. So uh, just to generate the query plan can take more time than, um, than, than, you, than you have for scoring. Uh, you, know, uh, you have the overhead of task scheduling, even if you're running that entire, you know, purely locally. 
So really it's optimized for uh, batch scenarios. In some cases, streaming micro batch, yes, it can work. But certainly if you have a hard uh, real-time limit, um, and that can, you know, depending on the domain that you're in, can range from microseconds through to, you know, I always think up to a few hundred milliseconds or half a, half a second in latency. Spark is just not going to cut it. It's not fast enough. So despite this elegant uh, API and, and, and you know, high-performance training, you, you, uh, you can't really use it for scoring. So in order to actually take that Spark pipeline that you've now trained and spent a lot of time working on and deploy it to production, uh, there, you need to do something completely custom. So Spark uses its own format for uh, exporting things. You have to write a custom reader for that format, load it back into, uh, into your own custom machine learning library for real-time scoring, or write some custom converter from the Spark uh, format into uh, your library of choice, whether that might be you know, a scikit-learn, a TensorFlow, an H2O, H2O uh, whatever it might be. Uh, so everything is custom. Uh, there's no kind of off-the-shelf solution. Well, there's sort of one that's a little bit older. We'll talk about one that is a bit newer. So the portable format for analytics is, a, is one of uh, the solutions that I believe uh, in for this particular problem. So it's an open standard for deploying uh, analytic pipelines. And it's been created by the data mining group, uh, of which IBM is a founding member, but there are many other uh, you know, uh, enterprises, large and small, involved in that group. And it's really trying to be the successor to PMML, which is the predictive model markup language. That's arguably the only uh, real open standard that is viable today. Uh, PMML is an XML-based uh, uh, serialization format, and it specifies the, the kind of transforms and model uh, that, that, that you modeling and, and pr prediction that you want to do in that pipeline. Um, so it, it's great, uh, and it has out-the-box support for many common components, you know, your logistic regressions, your, your uh, tree models and random forests and so on, some pre-processing, uh, but it has many limitations, and um, that has led to that exact problem of custom extensions. So everyone wrote custom extension, uh, extension points for PMML, uh, which completely nullified the benefit of that standard. So PFA was created specifically to address those shortcomings. And the idea is that um, instead of XML, it uses JSON, so a little bit more modern. Uh, that is the serialization format. Uh, it specifies schemas using Avro. So any uh, Avro data type uh, you, know, you can use, uh, which effectively covers anything you care about. Um, and then it encodes the set of functions or actions that you perform on your input to generate an output. So you can think of uh, this pipeline as a set of these transformation nodes. Uh, and PFA allows you to specify in a kind of um, mini-functional mini mathematical language what you do on the input to create the output. Uh, and of course, given a, a single uh, sort of set of PFA to do one transformation node, you can fairly easily combine the, those nodes together into one uh, holistic document. It's called a PFA document to specify your entire pipeline. So the type and function system um, means that once you've generated a valid PFA document, it can be effectively type-checked at runtime so that you know that there's not going to be any, um, any strange kind of runtime errors. Uh, so it, you've got type safety. Um, and it, once you've got a valid PFA document, you can run it uh, on any compliant PFA scoring engine. So you have true cross-platform, uh, cross-framework, cross-language portability. Uh, there are reference implementations available in, in Java, uh, Python R, you know, but typically for producing PFA documents uh, or, or, or model uh, versions of the model, serial, serialized model, you might be using you know, uh, Python or R to do that. Uh, for scoring, you're probably going to be using Java or you know, if you really want performance, maybe you, you're going to write something in C++ or, or Go or something like that. So this is uh, what it looks like. And you know, the, the, the JSON is, uh, is not really meant for human readability uh, necessarily. It makes it, uh, it easy for machines to generate. Um, so it's a bit verbose, uh, but here is, you know, for example, logistic regression. So we take in a, uh, a, a double array, which is just a you know, input vector, and we output a, a predicted class. So those are just Avro types, uh, and then the, the, the core function here is, is, is what we call the action, um, and that just specifies um, a set of functions to apply on the input to arrive at the output. So um, there are obviously a lot of built-in functions within PFA. Uh, you, can write, you can write your own user-defined functions. 
uh, using any of the built-in functionality, but you know, uh, there's some kind of handy stuff for your typical models, including linear models. So you just do a linear, uh, you call the linear regression um, uh, function, which takes uh, an input vector and a model cell. Now, um, we don't have that much time to go into cells, but a cell in PFA is just a way of specifying stored data. So um, it'll be typically the coefficients of your model uh, or any um, you know, state that your pipeline needs in order to do its work. Those will be stored in, in, in these kind of uh, immutable read-only cells. So this function takes the cell, which is the model, which is effectively the set of coefficients, uh, does a matrix multiplication, and you know, softmax link, argmax, and you know, you're done. So you know, despite being fairly verbose, you, know, you can see that the, the, the actual application of it is very simple. It's just, it's just, it's just doing the math and specifying that in, in this kind of DSL. So, as I mentioned, there are, uh, there are uh, reference implementations for PFA engines, and there is one in Java, but it doesn't really allow you to write PFA documents or create, you know, create that export from, uh, from something into a PFA document. And this is what I've created at the moment for SparkML, uh, and we call it Aardvark. I'm from South Africa, so you may know that an, an Aardvark is, uh, is, is something called an earth pig. It's like an anteater. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where the name comes from. Uh, but this, you know, the, the, the core of it is a Scala DSL, which you can see on the right here for creating PFA. And then Spark, Aardvark SparkML is the, uh, uses that same DSL to export to, you know, pipelines to Spark. We've got, um, and you can see, if, you know, if you compare uh, the Scala code to, uh, to, to the JSON, that's kind of uh, generating that exact JSON. Uh, so, you know, you've got an input, you define your cell with your data, uh, and then you, provide, you, you just specify uh, an, your action with, with, uh, with a Scala DSL. So the idea is to try and make it as, as natural as possible um, and uh, as type safe as possible, you know, uh, to, to do that. And we rely on Avro 4S to, to do some auto generation of case class magic and, uh, and, and uh, you know, automatically extract the, the, classes, uh, the, the types into Avro uh, types. So in terms of coverage, uh, we have full pipeline support, most feature transformers, almost all the machine learning models in Spark. There are some major missing features. Uh, for example, there's no generic vector in PFA, so you, you either have to have a dense vector or a sparse vector. And really, you, you want to have a generic one that can mix or match uh, that because it, it gets very cumbersome to try and deal with both. So very briefly, um, you know, why, why PFA? I mean, are there, are there, you know, why not something else? Are there other alternatives? Uh, MLEAP is a, is a good alternative, specifically for Spark and more recently for, uh, for scikit-learn and TensorFlow. It's completely written in Scala, which means that you know, if, um, it, if you want to, to do anything, uh, any custom export of your own model, you have to know Scala, which, which may or may not be a problem, but you know, many, many data scientists and machine learning engineers may not know Scala. They may be working in, in Python or C. Um, so it's an open format in the sense that it's open source, but it's not a standard, uh, and, and that has already led to a few issues in the project. Performance is very good, and coverage is very good. Um, but it, it really uh, has no, it doesn't have this concept of, of, uh, of independence uh, from, you know, uh, and across frameworks or, or, or versions. So you have a tight coupling between uh, the version of Spark that you use to generate the model and, and export to MLEAP uh, and the MLEAP version you run in production, which means every time you update your, your version, you have to change the version of both Spark and MLEAP in your production system, which is not ideal. And recently, the Open Neural Network Exchange was announced, ONNX. Um, it's a protocol buffer serialization format that also specifies the, the set of uh, actions or functions or operators that are applied in your graph, your neural network graph. Uh, it's quite specific to deep learning at this stage, but in, in that sense, it's very similar to PFA, and it appears to be a great standard for deep learning. But as I mentioned, it has pretty poor support for your traditional machine learning or, or analytic pipelines. So tree-based models, string processing, control flow, your intermediate variables are not really there. But this is something to watch. So in summary, PFA, um, I believe, provides a, an open standard for machine learning uh, pipeline deployment and analytic artifact deployment. Um, it tr provides true portability across languages, frameworks, uh, runtimes, and versions. And it provides you an ex a execution and scoring environment that is completely independent of the producer. So you can, whether you, uh, whatever language or framework you use to produce your model, you can keep the same uh, uh, scoring runtime and not have to worry about version changes 
upgrades and so on. It solves a significant pain point for the Spark ML ecosystem because it's, uh, you know, as I've mentioned previously, it's very difficult, if not if close to impossible, to actually deploy your Spark ML models currently. Um, and also benefits the wider ecosystem. You know, so uh, those that are using PMML to do export, XGBoost, LightGBM, Scikit-Learn R, can naturally uh, you know, kind of graduate at some point uh, to, to PFA. But there are risks. PFA is a, a young standard. It's still, in, you know, still developing. The performance is not tested um, at, at any scale in production. That is something that we are, are working on. Uh, what about deep learning? It's very hot right now, and, and you know, everyone wants to know about that. Can PFA be a, be a contender there, or is it just not suitable? You know, and, and the standard moves slowly, so if you want to change anything, you have to go through the standards committee. So that comes with benefits, the standardization of standardization, but you know, there are just some downsides around uh, open standards too. So to wrap up the future directions, uh, this is not a open source yet, uh, but we are working on uh, getting it to the state that it can be, uh, can be released. Uh, starting with Spark ML pipelines and then later looking to add support for Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, LightGBM and some of these other, uh, other projects. R already exists in the Hadrian project. There's a link there in the slides. Um, so, so many R uh, models and, and functionality already is uh, exportable. We we're busy perform, uh, doing performance testing uh, versus Spark versus MLeap um, and, and trying to kind of tease out where the performance issues are, of which there are, there are many. Um, and there, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, there uh, are a, a lot of gaps uh, even in the PFA standard. So one of the main ones is a support for generic uh, tensor or vector um, and performance improvements to the scoring engine. Uh, and then finally, we're, uh, we're looking at, you know, can, you, can one use PFA for deep learning? Uh, it requires all the, you know, this, this generic tensor schema. It requires your GPU operators um, uh, to be built in. Uh, and all the deep learning specific operators to be built in. Um, but I think that this is something that, that, that wouldn't be too difficult. Uh, and that's, that's what we would do. So thanks very much. There's some links and references in the slides which are online. Um, thanks for your time. Questions? Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Uh, I understand that the, uh, the the purpose of the standard is to facilitate this link between uh, R&D and the development of the models and then putting it in production. One of my concerns is, uh, I mean, supposedly this means that the framework used for development of the model and then for the inference might be different, right? So one concern I have is, when the actual implementation of the models is different, it doesn't mean that we're going to get the same results, right? Um, so, probably that's not the role of the, the standard to actually to solve, but don't you think that puts kind of a um, limitation uh, on, um, uh, on and that the practicalities of actually having this separation, you know, developing a model in one framework and running it in another? Yeah, uh, I think that's a good question. Um, and the, did everyone hear, hear the question? Yeah. So there are, there are obviously benefits to, to either approach. Um, so on, on the one hand, you've got this, this kind of multiplicity and plethora of uh, producers. We call them producers in, in, this, in this kind of scenario. They produce the model. And in some cases, you can use that same producer to, to score. So yeah, and, uh, generally, scoring in, for example, scikit-learn is, is really fast. Scoring in TensorFlow can be typically quite fast, and, yeah, and, with, and, and with some of these tricks of freezing the graph and, and making it more efficient at inference in time, it can be quite quick. Uh, scoring in R for a large model, for example, may not be fast. Uh, so you know, th on, on, that ha on, on that side of it, it's, it's, it's much easier to just say, okay, um, we'll use the same producer to score the model, and you can, you can solve some of the pain points of, of productionizing it, you know, um, so things like the version, the versioning, and, all, and 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 performance, and so on. Um, for example, using you know, Docker containers, and, and and there's a few projects that'll do that, where you know, you provide a, a kind of serving layer, and underneath are, are you know um, independent Docker containers, effectively, that will house that kind of model um, and, and effectively a scoring function, whether it's a you know a scikit learn uh, predict or transform, or whether it's a you know, TensorFlow uh, run. Um, so that, that is a valid approach, uh, 
but even then, you know, the, the, there's a uh, there's a big uh, challenge there in, in managing a, the, the uh, managing that version, the uh, the versioning and the, you know, the the runtime dependencies, and and the, the changes that happen. On the other side, with the uh, with the kind of standard approach, using a standard approach, um, yes, th th there's a big challenge in uh, creating the PFA version that's for argument's sake of the model, in the sense that you have to write that logic. Um, so it, you, know, you, you can, to some extent, have um, automatic translation layers that will take, uh, you know, try to inspect, let's say, a TensorFlow graph, for example, and convert that. And that's certainly possible, uh, but obviously a lot of work. Otherwise, you know, at the moment, for Spark, we've, we've kind of written them by hand. Uh, so that does involve a lot of duplication of logic, you know, writing it in a different form. Um, but for, for scoring, you typically need uh, much less logic than for training. So you, you, you know, the, the, the training pipeline can involve some very complex algorithmic uh, stuff happening. Scoring, as you, you know, as you saw, for even the most complex model, scoring is pretty, pretty much just a, a little bit of linear algebra and some lookups, and you know, it's pretty, pretty basic stuff. And that's that's really the core idea: is that um, this is this is not meant to to deal with training at all. It's meant to um, to make the, the scoring component kind of uh, easier to deploy and more standardized. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but it's not necessarily one solution. I think there are definite drawbacks to the standard, uh, and uh, I've listed a few of them. Um, and you do have to kind of rewrite a lot of the logic. But at the same time, um, once, you, once you've kind of done that, you're, you're then independent of any changes in, um, you know, any major changes in, in the producing framework. Of course, if, if the inference code or, or code path changes, you need to update that. But you know, it, does, it means you don't have to redeploy like an entire new version of your scoring system, for example. And that's, that, I think, is the, the, key, the key benefit, is that you can isolate your production system um, and have it just, just take in these, these arbitrary PFA documents. And as long as it's a compliant engine, it can read them and score them without ever upgrading that engine version, unless, of course, you need a new version for bugs or performance. Thank you very much.